So the next speaker is Daniel Ruth from UC Berkeley, who will talk about what the kind of categories of functions here and how about they can give a symmetry part. One of one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. So what I'm going to talk about is, well, the title is here. So I'm going to try to explain a little bit about mirror symmetry in the case of open Riemann surfaces, and more specifically, we'll focus on a couple of simple examples to try to get a sense of what's happening. And so the main technical ingredient in there is this wrapped thing, which I will have to mumble a few words about. And the goal is to convince you that maybe this is the right kind of Fouquet category to study open manifolds. And another goal is to maybe get you started thinking about, well, what kinds of cut and paste possibilities might be there, even though I don't have anything to say about them, but it's meant to be built into the story that this behaves in a more sheafy way. And I think maybe Mohammed will uh, you know, say more about that in his talks. Um, and also along the way, well, I'm going to focus on two examples, one classical, the other one less classical, and that's also meant to give an idea of what happens for manifolds of general type. So it will be a very simple instance of one. So first of all, for non-experts, well, what is mirror symmetry? Well, very broadly speaking, it's a connection, it, it's some relation between pairs of spaces, and you're supposed to be able to relate the symplectic geometry of one space with a complex geometry of another one, which is going to be called its mirror. And so there's to, let's call this space x, this space x dual. And there's two main instances, two main ways in which I want to say we have such a thing. So one of them is geometrically, as a differential geometer, there's the SYZ or Strominger Yao Zaslow conjecture, which says that mirror symmetry comes from a duality between Lagrangian torus vibrations. And so that predicts how you're supposed to find instances of such pairs other than by asking a physicist. And then there's the a more algebraic formulation, which is the homological mirror symmetry conjecture of Konsevich. And that one says that we are supposed to have, to have a derived equivalence between two categories. So one is, broadly speaking, the Fouquet category of X. So that's supposed to have as objects Lagrangian submanifolds. And well, morphisms are, go are given by intersections between these submanifolds. And compositions and other structures are given by Fleur theory. So Lagrangian Fleur homology. And on the other side, we're supposed to look at coherent sheaves. on the mirror of X. And well, you don't have a one-to-one -one correspondence. It's not going to be the case in general that a Lagrangian submanifold corresponds to a sheaf and vice versa. Uh, it's only a derived equivalent. So that means after you enlarge things sufficiently to get the right kind of algebraic structures. So by passing to chain complexes of such objects and working up to homotopy and so on, you can get you know, an easier and better match. Okay, so. In some sense, you mean, oh, uh, where was duality between tori? Um, in some sense, yes. But sometimes you have to look hard enough to find this duality you know, hidden beneath the surface. So, in fact, in one of the two examples I will give, it doesn't quite look that way until I tell you more about it, which I hope to do at the end.
So I'm going to focus on two examples, which are both instances of punctured spheres, as you will notice quickly. So one is going to be C star, which has the advantage of being classical as far as mirror symmetry goes. It's a perfectly well-behaved Calabiao example. And you know, I'll use that to kind of set things up and you know, get you introduced to these objects and explain what a wrapped Fouquet category is. And then we'll be slightly more ambitious and we'll look at the pair of pants, which is the sphere with three holes instead of two. And that one is less classical, so we'll have to talk more about it. Okay, so in general, I mean, what I'm going to say would extend to many other kinds of open Riemann surfaces with mostly notational difficulty added. Maybe a little bit more. But, um, but somehow these are the simplest illustrative examples. And so along the way, we are going to see that, you know, question is, what do we need by the Fouquet category when we have an open manifold? And so what we're going to look at is actually the wrapped Fouquet category. I'm going to try to convince you that this is the flavor of Fouquet category that makes mirror symmetry work for such spaces. And so this is something that was defined by Abu Zaid and Seidel in the last few years. Okay, so in fact, maybe I should right away tell you a bit more about these wrapped Fouquet categories. Uh, first, because it will make the rest of my life easier, and second, because well, this is supposed to be you know, there's supposed to be Fleur homology hiding in here. And but I'm going to restrict myself to the one-dimensional case where things are very easy to draw and to understand. So. So we're going to do this in dimension one. And you know, I'm going to do it without the details and with some hand waving because the actual details are complicated. But I'm actually not lying too much in this particular case. Dimension one is friendly. So the general setup is we're going to have an open exact symplectic manifold. Open exact symplectic manifold. So the symplectic form is actually exact. And it has some you know, convexity property at infinity. And in our case, we'll just think of a Riemann surface that we can obtain actually from a compact one by puncturing. So we're going to have some cylindrical ends that just look like infinite cylinders. And so we're going to look at Objects, well, objects of a Fouquet category should be Lagrangian submanifolds. So, you know, you might have compact objects like that. But really, what we care more about is also allowing some non compact Lagrangians. And so, what we are going to require for is that they are reasonably well behaved at infinity. So, well behaved means, for example, that outside of a compact subset, they just go radially into the cylindrical ends. So what I'm going to say is objects are going to be exact Lagrangians manifold. So concretely, that just means you know, simple closed curves satisfying the exactness condition. That means the integral of theta on them should be 0. That kind of fixes them inside. That fixes a preferred Hamilton isotopic class inside the topological isotopic class. And for arcs, they're automatically exact. But we want to require that outside a compact set, they're going to be translation invariant in the cylindrical ends. So as on the picture. And well, so as usual in a Fouquet category, we're supposed to define 
homs between two Lagrangian submanifolds as given by intersection points. I'm going to use complex numbers as my coefficients. You could really use anything you want. Uh, it's just so that you know the mirror looks more like the usual complex mirrors. But now there's a small issue here, which is we would like Fleur homology to be invariant under Hamiltonian isotopies. And certainly, if you have two Lagrangians that go out to infinity, well, invariance under isotopies will be problematic because this kind of intersection here, you know, might die if I just push this guy up a little bit, or I might push it around once, that will create another intersection. So the way to address that, yes? Sorry, uh, is translation, translation invariant with respect to what? The cylindrical structure at infinity. If you want, uh, I can say, you know, invariant under the Liouville flow. If you want, I have uh, the Liouville flow. I have a Liouville flow, you know, secretly my manifold is a Weinstein or Liouville symplectic manifold. Okay, so. Anyway, given what I will do with it, really all that matters is that it doesn't keep zigzagging back and forth infinitely often in there. I mean, really, you know, anything sensible, it really doesn't matter, as you will see from the definition. So, okay, so we are going to have to fix, you know, s some behavior at infinity so that we can have invariance of at least the intersection numbers. And so what we'll do is we'll use a Hamiltonian perturbation to move L0 so that it's in the right position relatively to L1. So the generators will be intersections between phi of L0 and L1, where phi is going to be, well, maybe I should say, going to be a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism of x. And roughly speaking, what this is going to be is phi is going to be close to identity in a compact set. And phi is going to be a rotation in the cylindrical ends. And rotation, well, induced by actually, so it's actually the time one flow of some Hamiltonian, which is quadratic in the cylindrical ends. And since there's some debate about what quadratic means, all I will draw, all I will do is actually draw a picture of what it does to my Lagrangian. So what it means is I will modify this part of my Lagrangian so that actually it goes around and around and around the cylindrical end infinitely many times, roughly at constant speed. So it doesn't really matter. It could be forward and sort of turn in two different directions or more. Sorry? Could it not turn in different directions? Uh, what do you mean by turn? Oh. You could have the fact that it's plus r squared tells me no. how big, right? Yes, you choose plus r squared. In higher dimensions, you would use the right flow. I mean, you use, right. So in general, you know, in higher dimensions, you would have something that, which is look, uh, looks like a symplectization of a contact manifold, yes, okay. and you use just the radial coordinate. But you take positive, positive rate so flow. It's always positive. Yes. I mean, otherwise, you would end up defining basically the opposite category. No. Ah. Yeah, but you could take the image of everything under H again. And, okay. Never mind. All right, anyway, so the picture is this, okay? And really what I use is a positive quadratic Hamiltonian in the ends to spin or wrap the first of the two. All right, so it's a positive rotation in the cylindrical ends. Okay, and well, there's going to be on this the Fleur differential will count holomorphic strips as usual, but I'm not going to worry about it because, I mean, for the purpose of my talk, it will be zero. So, you know, that will make my life easier. Um, what I'm more interested in is telling you about the Fleur product, which gives me composition in this category. And so what I'm going to say is, okay, I want to define a product that takes a morphism from L0 to L1 and one from L1 to L2 
and outputs a morphism from L0 to L2. So how do I do that? Well, as usual, I have two intersection points P and Q, and I will map that to a sum of other intersection points where each coefficient is supposed to count holomorphic triangles. So and PQR is going to be counting holomorphic triangles, except, well, so with the pretense that I'm using, I'm supposed to look at triangles whose boundary is on suitably perturbed copies of my Lagrangians. So L2 stays the way it was, but I'm supposed to perturb L1 by this Hamiltonian flow, and I'm supposed to perturb L0 even more. So I'm going to take the square of phi, or if you want the time 2 map of my Hamiltonian. And so now here, an intersection point between phi of L1 and phi squared of L0, that's the image by phi of an intersection between phi of L0 and L1. So here I will put phi of P. Here I will put Q is conveniently the right kind of thing. And here I will put something which is, see, that's kind of slightly funny. It's not quite what I wanted, but almost. I'm going to call R prime, and I'm going to make an outrageous claim, which is that if we look at the intersections between phi squared of L0 with L2, they correspond naturally to the intersections of phi of L0 with L2, because all you're doing is you're spinning twice as fast, so instead, you could compress the radial direction by a factor of 2, and it would look the same. Okay, so if you want to say things more carefully, then I'm afraid you have to read Mohammed's papers. Um, start with the actual technical definition. Sorry, so first I should have said, you know, it's the count of holomorphic disks in the manifold with boundaries like that. But the actual definition, rather, what you do is you don't perturb the Lagrangians. Instead, you perturb the equation by Hamiltonian perturbations. And that's, you know, in the case of Freeman surfaces, it's the same up to switching to a domain dependent J, which nobody cares about in dimension one. So I'm allowed to do this. Oh, not yet ready for what's below. Okay. No. Uh, uh, yes. And a similar definition, but you know, being slightly more careful about what I mean by rotation, also works in higher dimensions. OK. Yeah, so I'm not assuming anything about the genus or about the number of ends or anything. All right. Oh, and there's also, of course, higher products which count polygons with more edges, more boundaries. And of course, again, perturbing everything in a suitable way. And so what we're going to get out of this is an A infinity category. And I will not say too, too much about that so that I don't scare those people in here who are not into A infinity things. Um, you should think of messy products, so if you want homotopies that tell you by how much product is not meant to be associative at chain level. Of course, in our case, since the differential is zero, it is actually associative at chain level, but it's not meant to be. All right, so that's the very brief definition. And so now what I'm going to do is try to explain a bit about the example of C star, unless there's questions before that. OK, so C star, well, the claim is, first of all, that the mirror of C star is also C star. And so if I had to do you know, an explanation in terms of the stromberger yaus law principle, I would say that, OK, each of them, I mean, C star is really R times S1, and this is a duality between trivial circle vibrations over the real line. So it looks like not much is happening there. Um, OK, duality between trivial S1 bundles 
over R. So, but the point is that this actually has more predictive power than it seems. Because these two circles are meant to be dual to each other. Maybe in a sense that's kind of reminiscent of Fourier transform or something like that. So in particular, this also tells us not just how to get the spaces, but also if I have a Lagrangian section here, how to transform it into a sheaf, or actually in this case a bundle, on the mirror. So OK, so let's start with the algebraic side. So any good algebraic geometer will tell you that C star is spec of the ring of Laurent polynomials. And so if I look at coherent sheaves, these are finite type modules over this ring of Laurent polynomials. And you know, another way of saying it is that coherent sheaf is a module over holomorphic functions. And all you need to know is really how to multiply by z. And that needs to be invertible. So you know, another piece of cultural information is that, in fact, O, the trivial line bundle, generates the derived category of coherent sheaves. And the reason is that any coherent sheaf on C star admits a resolution by locally free things. Or equivalently, you can say that any finite type module over this ring is, admits a free resolution. So you can write it as the co-kernel of a map between well, copies of these guys, and that ends at some finite amount of time. OK, so what that means, OK, and what else do I want to say? What are endomorphisms of O? Well, that's just, you know, how do you go from O to itself? The easy thing to do is you just multiply by a Laurent polynomial. And that's all there is. And so, in fact, the way in which any coherent sheaf becomes a module over that, you can say, is just by making it a module over O. Kind of being tautological, but when you take this through mirror symmetry, it actually has interesting implications for Fouquet categories. Okay. So what we need to do to try to prove homological mirror symmetry is find a counterpart to this story. So to prove homological mirror symmetry for C star, what we need to do is find you know, the symplectic analog of that. So we need to understand for the Fouquet category, actually, let me say the wrapped Fouquet category, which is usually denoted by W of C star, to find. Well, so we need to find a Lagrangian L0, which is going to be more or less a mirror to O. Then we need to compute endomorphisms of L0. So if you want, that's just going to be the wrapped Fleur cohomology of L0. And we would like that to be isomorphic to the ring of Laurent polynomials. And then we would like to show also that L0 generates the Fouquet category. So namely, every Lagrangian can be resolved by copies of this guy. OK, so what is L0? Well, so I'm on C star, which I think of as an infinite cylinder, R times S1. And I'm just going to take 
a straight line that runs through it. So if you want, this is R plus inside C star. running from 0 to infinity. And you know, the motivation for that in terms of SYZ duality is that if you have the trivial line bundle over here, then its Fourier transform in some suitable sense is just going to be the 0 section on the other side. So that's what we're supposed to do. OK, so question is, how do we compute the endomorphisms of L0 in the wrapped category? Well, we start wrapping it. So we look at phi of L0. So inside, we don't perturb to too much, a little bit to achieve transversality. But then in the ends, we'll start wrapping it around so that it looks like that. I believe this should be the positive direction. And well, we find that endomorphisms of L0 is a direct sum of infinitely many intersection points. Let me call them P0, P1, so it has more P2, and so on. And here I have P minus 1, P minus 2, and so on. And well, that has infinite rank, which is kind of a good start, you know, because that guy also has infinite rank as a vector space. And in fact, you know, the natural basis is also indexed by integers. But of course, there's many things we could do. So to settle this, we would like to compute the multiplication structure. So for that, we have to compute Pn times Pm. And for that, what we need is three different copies of our Lagrangian, which conveniently happened to be here, except my notation was not quite the same back then. <laughs> But anyway, uh, right, so Pn is going to be you know, corresponding to z to the n. And so the observation is that if I, if I look at three different successively more and more wrapped copies of my L0, then if I pick any two intersection points between L0 and phi of L0 and between phi of L0 and phi squared of L0, then there's a unique triangle and that determines a third intersection point, and that gives me a single term. So in this notation here, it's p sub n plus m, or z to the n times z to the m equals z to the n plus m. And the fastest way to see that this actually works is to lift to the universal cover, and then you have honest triangles between parallel lines, and it's much easier to see. OK, so that's pretty good we have the right algebra. Oops. Now, actually, if you're a bit more careful, you'll know that, I mean, I, I say that we only have an infinity category. So in fact, we should worry a little bit more and worry about whether there might be higher products. And the claim is higher products are identically 0. Uh, one way to see this is if you add more copies of these things, you will not be able to find any convex quadrilaterals or higher polygons with the correct corners. Um, another way of saying it is that actually there's a Z grading on Fleur homology by Maslow index, but my functions, you know, being convex only have index zero critical points. And then the grading condition tells me immediately that there cannot be any higher products. And there's a Z grading on Fleur theory, and MK, the K fold multiplication, would have degree 2 minus K with respect to this grading. But everything is in degree 0. OK, so that's pretty good. Um, and in fact, you know, so another thing you might worry about, you know, what other kinds of Lagrangians do we have in there? Well, there's not very many others. I mean, besides that straight line, okay, you can twist a bit around, but you can see easily that with this prescription, that does nothing. There's no point in trying to twist around. And that's good because we don't have any non-trivial holomorphic bundles on C star. We do have closed curves. There's not too many simple closed curves on C star, but you might ask, what is this? Well, and using our main philosophy, we want to think of it as a module over the endomorphisms of L0. So the point is, this is going to be 
mirror to the points of C star, or maybe I should say skyscraper sheaves of points of C star. Um, so skyscraper sheaves of points correspond to torsion modules of rank one. So think of the form C of Z is the inverse mod Z minus lambda for some lambda in C star. And the remarkable observation is that if you take this Lagrangian here and you try to compute its Fleur cohomology with L0, so let me call that L sub lambda, that will be kind of reminiscent actually of Chris's, Chris Woodward's talk, um, then of course hum of L lambda with L0 is going to have rank one. It's just going to be a rank one module. And the question, of course, is what happens when I start multiplying by endomorphisms of L0? And what you will find is that Z, well, to find multiplication by Z, you just have to compute one Fleur product. And with a suitable weighting conventions, so I want to actually set the Novikov parameter equal to some arbitrary non-zero constant, I will actually get a parameter lambda here, which is going to be a complex number related to how far along this guy is. And secretly, there's also a local system on my Lagrangian. Yes? Yes, so I'm lying to you. I mean, the point is, if I, want, if I insist on doing it among the exact things, then I can only realize it as a mapping cone of something. No? Yes, I can do that. Okay. So I would secretly want to work with non allow non-exact compact Lagrangians, which is fine in this case because the topology prevents any kind of bubbling and circle S1 local systems. But as Mohammed said, I could make it exact and have a C star local system. Okay. All right. That was meant to be mostly motivational anyway. Uh, but the point is now you're, you're done because you don't have to worry about more. There's no other Lagrangians in there. And that shows to you that L0 generates with Fourier category by hand. But otherwise, you could appeal to a more general result by Mohammed, which is really not needed in this particular case. Okay. More questions? So next, I'm going to try to move on to the pair of pants and tell you about that example, which is somewhat more interesting because, you know, by default, it's not clear what the mirror should be. So in fact, let's try to understand what the mirror should be by similar calculations. So let's look at the case where x is now going to be a pair of pants. If you want a sphere minus three points. And well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to study its wrap fouquet category by postulating that I'm interested in some specific Lagrangians. So the guys I'm going to want to look at, I will call L0, L1, and L2. So imagine that you, you, know, you continue them out in the cylindrical ends in a straight direction. And well, so the claim is in fact the wrapped category of X is generated by this free fix L0, L1, L2. And in fact, L0 and L1 suffice, but L2 is there for symmetry. So the way, I mean, there are several ways of proving this, but they will not make sense unless you know a little bit more about the theory. So one option is to observe that there's actually a left shots vibration on this, namely a simple branched cover map to the disk, and such that these things are thimbles of this, actually, branched cover. And then by a general result of Paul Seidel, they generate the Fouquet category of the left shots vibration and hence the wrapped one. Or there's a more general result again of Mohammed Abu Zaid, which tells us that these things 
generate by some much more powerful criterion. Essentially, what it boils down to is checking that these things decompose my surface into disks. <coughs> That's what, it, that's what his criterion says in the case of Riemann surfaces. So as soon as I cut into disks, I'm done. And that's why two would be enough. Bless you. All right. So the question is, what are morphisms between these things? And what is the corresponding algebra? So first thing I have to understand. OK, so let me try to draw a picture that focuses on things a slightly different way. See, so the observation is this is really the same as what I had before, but with an extra puncture in the middle. So in particular, if I want to understand Holmes of L0 with itself, well, really nothing's changed, except that now I have a hole in the middle. But I still have a Z worth of intersections. Now, how does that affect the product structure? Well, so let's go back to my big picture over there. The main difference is that now I'm going to puncture a hole somewhere. And so now what happens is either the triangle I was interested in passes through the puncture or it doesn't. If it doesn't, then it's still there. If it goes through the puncture, then it no longer exists. Pretty easy. So wh what that means is I just kill some of the products. Some of the products still look like that, and some others are zero. And what's the criterion? How do I go over the puncture? Well, if I put the puncture in the middle, See, the extreme points, left and right, are z to the a and z to the b. And it turns out the criterion is that a and b should have different signs. If they have different signs, then I'm actually going to be in trouble because my triangle will cover completely the middle portion. So I mean, you can check that by unrolling things and seeing what happens. So the claim is going to be that endomorphisms of L0 look again like some sort of polynomial algebra, but now z and z inverse don't multiply to 1 anymore, they multiply to 0. So maybe I shouldn't call them z and z inverse anymore. Okay, I'm going to give them different names. Let's say c of xy mod xy to say that their product is now 0. Now, same thing for L1 and for L2. So L1 is going to have also the same kind of endomorphisms, I'm going to st slightly change my notations because of what comes next. Now, the next question is, what are morphisms between L0 and L1? And you see L1, so let's say this was L0, this was phi of L0, twisty one. And L1 was actually coming out of there. And so I only get half of the intersections. And so secretly, what I will do is I will label my ends by x, y, and z. And you know, successive intersections in there correspond to powers of x, y, and z. So the claim is with more computations. So you have to draw lots and lots of pictures of these guys. I can complete my story in this kind of way. Do I have the correct ends? Uh, I clearly mislabeled my intersections. Sorry. X and Y. OK. Yes. OK. So anyway, this is what comes at the end of the calculation, where I've somehow simplified the notation for you by identifying everybody with polynomials in x, y, and z, so that it's clear what all of the products in there are. See, secretly, hum, say, hum L0, L1 is a bimodule on the left of our endomorphisms of L0 and on the right of our endomorphisms of L1. And what I'm making apparent here is how to compose, say, an endomorphism here with a morphism here, or, I mean, pretty much any composition. So that's pretty good news. Um, the bad news is that there's also a non-trivial 
M3 higher product. More specifically, if I do M3 of, if I've done this in the wrong, yeah. Up to sign. For example, if I multiply the element, oh, no, sorry, that's not what I meant. You know what, I'm not going to tell you of what. I mean, of the generators, well, of the generators of these things, okay? But they're all called one, which is very unfortunate because that's not what I wanted to call them. Uh, but if I multiply the generators all around here, I get the identity and the morphism of L0. And the reason is if I start pushing things around, I start forming a triangle which basically captures the fundamental class of L0. Oops, sorry. Okay, so let's ignore this higher product and the fact that there's more higher products further that are lurking behind. And let's try to see what that would tell us about a potential mirror. So the point is, now you can start to look at torsion modules over this big algebra formed by all these things together. So secretly, what you'd like to say is if I have any Lagrangian in X, any object of this category, it should embed into A infinity modules over this algebra A formed by all this. So this is endomorphisms of L0 direct sum L1 direct sum L2 and this is in the A infinity sense. So abstract algebra tells me, I mean, it's part of, it's almost the definition of generating a category that a Lagrangian up to quasi-isomorphism in here is completely determined by how it intersects with those three guys. So how can I use that to my advantage? Well, see, from a purely homological mirror symmetry perspective, this means if I want to understand the points of a mirror, then I should be looking for some torsion modules over this huge algebra. And well, basically, to have you know, relatively small torsion modules because of all these structures, you need to live on only two sides. You can have, you, you have torsion modules which have rank one over two other places where you set basically one of the variables x, y, or z equal to some constant. And then you have to set the others equal to zero. The point is, I mean, see, if you try to take everything at once and think of x, y, and z as coordinates, you know, by analogy with the case before where I had c of z, z inverse, and z was a coordinate on c star, I would like to say that there's something to do with c cubed in here, with coordinates x, y, z. But the fact that x times y is zero, x times z is zero, and y times z is zero, tells me that really no more than one of these is allowed to be non-zero. So in fact, torsion modules, and I believe the smallest one I can see are of rank two over C, but I'm, I'm not completely sure. So correspond exactly to the points on the coordinate axis in C cubed with coordinates x, y, and z. Okay, so that seems to mean that in some sense, the mirror of my pair of pants might be the union of the coordinate axis in C cubed. But that neglects the presence of this higher product M3 and a lot of other issues. So in fact, the actual answer is a bit more complicated. The actual answer is that the mirror of a pair of pants is what's called a Landau-Ginzburg model, which you've secretly seen in the previous talk. Namely, the space is C cubed, and there's a potential of the form XYZ. And 
what that means is you're supposed to actually have a correspondence derived equivalence not between well, between that category, the derived level at least, um, but with a category called matrix factorizations of this superpotential. This is a deformation of the derived category of coherent sheaves by this superpotential in the following sense. This is matrix factorizations. So what's the idea? Well, what's a coherent sheaf over C cubed with coordinates x, y, z? Well, it's going to be a module over the polynomial ring in three variables. And so if we're just looking at vector bundles or three modules, they would be given you know, by just direct sums of. Now, what's an object of a derived category? Well, it would be a complex built out of such things, and so on, where I have differentials, and the composition of the differentials would be 0. So instead, to continue, I'm going to modify this in two ways. One is we'll want actually this to be two periodic, so there's only really an odd and an even term. And the other condition we want is that d0, d1, or d1, d0, are not going to be 0, but rather are going to be equal to this potential x, y, z. So maybe I should say, call it w times identity. And so deep down, what you know, this has to do with Fleur theory is that basically you know, this m3 that we captured and this x, y, z I mean, it's a holomorphic disk that obstructs Fleur theory and deforms d squared in Fleur theory away from being zero. We don't see that as long as we look at exact Lagrangians, but if we looked at some other more complicated obstructed Lagrangians, we would notice that something is wrong. Somehow Fleur homology relatively to L0, L1, and L2, all taken together with the extra algebraic structures, is somehow curved by W. OK. And oh, right. And so then the only point modules over this kind, you know, this kind are actually supported at critical points of W. I mean, more precisely, if you took, if you try to take over point modules, they would be null homotopic. Yeah, so W comes from abstraction. And the other problem is, yes. So the other problem is actually we don't, I mean, in this case, we do have a Z grading. But in general, we would not expect to have a Z grading in full generality. We would only have Z mode 2 grading in Fleur homology. Um, the other, I mean. But you still have an infinite sequence. Or, I mean, or well, uh, well, it's no longer bounded because, I mean, it's too periodic. Yeah, so, you, you know, I mean, this story that it's just a deformation of the usual one is kind of, I mean, I, I can't push it all the way through, okay? I mean, so anyway, that's, that, that's really what we want to think about. Yeah, I guess it's, I mean, by being too periodic, it cannot be bounded anymore. But, or it is automatically, I mean, depends what you, I mean, you could say that it's obtained from a bounded complex by folding it back and forth. That's maybe one way of saying it. Okay, so 
anyway, so I hope I've kind of given you an introduction to you know, a little bit about what the Rab Fouquet categories achieve. But maybe I have to give you know, more evidence for this claim about what the mirror is and try to explain geometrically where this comes from. You know, I've kind of tried to give an, a hand wavy, uh, I, I tried to give a, a hand wavy algebraic explanation for why I might want to consider C cubed with X, Y, Z, just because it's what arises out of this picture. But what does it mean geometrically? Why is that a dual torus vibration? I mean, obviously, if I start with a one-dimensional thing and I end up with a three-dimensional thing, something is fishy. So, another question. What about SYZ duality between torus vibrations? So someday, you know, I'm going to write something that doesn't quite make sense yet, but maybe 10 years from now, this is what people will be saying. You know, the naive thing you might want to do is try to say, okay, my pair of pants has, you know, cylindrical ends which contain all these families of circles. And then in the middle, while well, I have something a little bit strange, maybe I would put a trivalent graph, or maybe I will put some other kind of thing. And Roughly speaking, you know, if I look at just the critical locus of my superpotential, I told you it's the union of the coordinate axes. So that's like three copies of C intersecting transversely at the origin. So, you know, we'd like to claim maybe there's something like this going on. And here I'm supposed to remember that, you know, we are not quite looking just at this space, but we are looking at it with this superpotential. And in fact, really, to do so needs the ambient space. And I'm back in trouble. I don't really know what I'm talking about here. And I'm afraid I don't have anything better to say at this level. So instead, what we'll do is we'll replace the pair of pants by a better space for the purpose of doing SYZ. So I need something that has a better torus vibration, something that looks more like an honest torus vibration. Oh, sorry. That's not my place. So there's several constructions, but the one I want to explain is something that's in a joint paper that doesn't exist yet with Mohammed Abu Zaid and Ludmil Kazarkov. Um, so it's part of a more general story, which is how do we build mirrors to hypersurfaces in toric varieties? And so what we're going to do is we're going to think of X, which was this pair of pants, as a hypersurface in star squared where h is a generic line say in cp2 for example okay so and concretely what i do is i just look at c star squared and i take a generic line and of course after i intersect it with c star squared i delete two points from it or oh, so a third point at infinity in there and then i end up with my pair of pants so and what we're going to build a mirror for is not quite X, but a replacement, which is in a better category of spaces for me, namely spaces with effective first churn class. Ah, I'll never be able to erase that because of the color. So I might as well return over here. So I look at a different manifold, let's call it V, which is the blow up of C star squared times C along H times zero. So I'm suddenly jumping up in dimension by two. And what does this space look like? Well, this is really a bundle over C star squared where, so the generic fiber is just going to be 
a line C, so I haven't done anything. But then, if I'm along H, which I'm going to draw again as a pair of pants, then at above a point of H, of course I have done a blow up, so I have an exceptional curve from the blow up, union, the proper transform of the line I started with. And now, okay. So now the point is the complement. Okay, so let sorry, let's take D to be the proper transform of C star squared times zero. So on that picture, it's a section which consists of a point here and a point inside each of those P1s. And the claim is that the complement V minus D carries a Lagrangian torus vibration. A vibration by Lagrangian T freeze which is exactly going to be singular along a copy of a pair of pants. So more specifically, I mean, well, I think this is going to be approximative, but roughly the way I want to think about it is this space carries a Hamiltonian S1 action by rotation of the last coordinate. S1 acts by rotation here, and that action lifts to the blow-up. So of course I'm losing the toric structure with respect to this side, but that's okay. Because what's remarkable is if I take now a level set of a moment map and I quotient by S1, the observation is that the reduced spaces are all C star squared. Now, for what's happening is there's a new stratum of fixed points of the S1 action that comes from the blow up, which is exactly these points that I've drawn here. So, but the reduced spaces don't really know it. So the reduced spaces are all C star squared. They all carry the obvious vibration by product tori. Well, I have to worry a bit more because actually the symplectic form on the reduced spaces is not always quite the standard one, but close enough. And so then by spinning back by the S1 action, I get Lagrangian tori in the total space. However, they are singular when they pass through these points because, well, there I, I can spin all I want. The S1 orbit is degenerate. And so, okay, so this has a Lagrangian torus vibration. The base looks like upper half space, but with singularities along a copy of the amoeba, <coughs> so some sort of thickened triangle. And this is the kind of thing that we know how to dualize. So we can apply you know, SYZ type story as corrected by, well, I should probably mention Konsevich, Seubelman, Gross, Siebert, and others. And that tells us how to build a mirror. So the point is V minus D is an open Calabi Yau manifold. And it's going to be mirror to well, some actually something which actually miraculously happens to be uh, well, by general principle, it's going to be a non-compact toric variety. But actually, here it happens to be just C cubed, or more precisely, a small caveat: C cubed minus the hypersurface x y z equals one. But doesn't make a difference for what we care about. Okay, so that's mirror symmetry for open Calabi-Yau's in the sense of SYZ. And of course, on this one, you have a highly non-standard Lagrangian torus vibration. It's not the one you think of. It has also singularities, again, along some sort of trivalent thing. And now, okay, but that's not what we wanted. If we look at V, we'll be one step closer. And V, so that was the blow up of that thing, is obtained from that one by plugging back in our divisor. 
So in terms of Lagrangian fleur homology, I think in a divisor it doesn't really change which Lagrangians you have, but it changes what kinds of disks they bound. So that's exactly turning on obstruction in fleur theory. And so that corresponds exactly to turning on a superpotential on the mirror. And so that's exactly, well, the point is you can actually calculate the superpotential and you'll find that it's exactly this x, y, z. And now you might ask what's the relation between v and our pair of pants. And on the b side, which is not the one we've been using, but for algebraic geometry, there's a theorem, well, which probably doesn't hold in this case, because I think it's for projective varieties, but close enough. There's a result of Bondal and Orloff, which says if you blow up something along a co-dimension two sub-variety, then the derived category is an extension of what you started with by what you blew up. So now in our case, we blew up something that was pretty silly, c star squared times c, didn't have very much meat to it, so really the interesting part came from what we blew up. On the symplectic side, there's not a very clear final result, but Ivan Smith has done some work relating the Fouquet categories of these two to each other as well. So basically, we like to say that this one is a substitute for x for the purpose of SYZ mirror symmetry. And in this case in particular, there's sufficiently little to the thing we had before blow up that it doesn't really matter if you, you know, include it or not. Well, actually, the difference is probably this. All right, so this extends to more general settings, but I don't have time for that, and anyway, that would be a different story. So thank you very much. <laughs>